So there's the crowd, parents bringing children to Jesus, that Jesus might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them into his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, the truth that it is, uh, what it teaches us, and how it uh, shows us that we might live for you. Lord, in here we see... We see your heart for children, for uh, the family, and, and we see how it is that we who are members of the kingdom should, should, be, should be, should live, what uh, should characterize our hearts. And Lord, as we look into this passage, we pray that through it you would uh, work in us, that we might uh, more resemble you, that we would greater understand you and ourselves, and just lead us to worship of through this amazing grace that you've given us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to this passage, we're, you're probably thinking, well, we didn't, weren't we just talking about children a few weeks ago? And yes, in fact, just a few weeks ago in, in uh, the ninth chapter, in verses 35 to 37, Jesus is teaching the disciples. It says he He sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. When we read that passage a few weeks ago, Part of what we looked at was the the context of the culture, understanding what the culture thought of of children in that day and time. And at this time and place in history, the mortality rate was so high that many babies and young children would die before they reached age five. And due in part to this reality, the society did not have a high regard for children. They didn't consider a child significant until he was older and more likely to survive. And again, this really affected the way that they viewed children. Some were, were loved, but others sometimes were exploited and neglected, depending on how the child might benefit the family. I want to read to you just a, a line from a letter written in 1 BC from a husband to his expectant wife. He said of their unborn child, If it was a male, let it live. If it was female, cast it out. This is the kind of mindset that existed, at least in part, there at the time of Christ. Infanticide, the practice of murdering young children, was not uncommon, but it was, it was outlawed finally in 375 AD in Roman law. Until that time, Roman law gave the father absolute power over his home and over his family, including their life and even death. And as we hear things like this, it's, it's appalling, isn't it, to, to think that, that that's, what, uh, that's what was thought in that day and time. But sadly, not much has changed today. The world doesn't view children much differently than they did at the time of Jesus. It's not that children have a high mortality rate as they did in the, the New Testament era, New Testament period. Instead, Americans oftentimes will do anything they can to keep from having children. The act given by God to married couples for intimacy and procreation has been turned into an act that is merely for recreation and personal pleasure with no boundaries whatsoever. It doesn't matter who, it doesn't matter when, and it doesn't matter why when it comes to this sort of activity. And if then by chance a child is conceived, or then he or she is so often murdered in the womb before the child is even given a chance to live. I don't have the most recent statistics, But in 2017, 862,320 babies were aborted. I didn't round because every one of those lives matters. Um, That's 18% of pregnancies in America, and that was four years ago. So it's not just the first century. This kind of mindset persists today, and it's utterly horrifying, as I think you would agree. But I suggest that this is simply a result of a world that does not value life. It's a world that worships self 
worldly pleasure and autonomy, and it certainly does not value children. But the truth is, when we reflect the heart of Christ, it's going to look radical to a watching world around us. When we live the life as Christ would have us to live, and we, when we reflect the heart of Jesus in our own lives and in our actions, it looks radical to a watching world around us. And one of the ways that we see this is in our view of children. And again, that brings us to our, our text today. And as we begin to look at this passage, I want, I want us to see something so simple that we might look over it. Look at me, if you would, at the first part of verse 13. It says, And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. Notice this. Jesus was the kind of person that people wanted their children to be around. People wanted to have their children to, with Jesus. Jesus attracted kids and families. Jesus loved kids and having kids around him, and those watching him could tell. They could tell just by looking at him. You know, what a challenge to us today who strive to be like Jesus. Can people tell by watching us, by watching you, that you love children, that you value children, appreciate them. Those who have been parents and even those who have not, have you ever been around someone who, by the way they act or by the way they talk, it's clear that they don't want to be around kids or your kids in particular, maybe. Uh, and you, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you even have a picture of a situation in your mind. But the Scottish minister of the 19th century, uh, George MacDonald, once said that he doubted a man's Christianity if, Christian, or if children were never found playing around his door. He doubted that a man was a Christian if there weren't kids around him. Well, Jesus wasn't that guy. He wanted kids around. Kids and their parents were attracted to him. And if we are going to follow Jesus, then we should be that kind of people too. Additionally, on Mother's Day, we ought to point out something else. Parents, you are the most influential and important person in your kids' lives. You have the greatest impact on them of anyone else that will come into their lives. So love them well. Teach them well. Teach them the scriptures and take this role seriously. But in addition to that, on the other hand, you don't want to be the only godly influence in the lives of your children, do you? You want other Christians, other godly men and women in their lives that they can watch, that they can see, that they can learn from. And these people in our passage this morning wanted their kids around Jesus. They were trying to get their kids to Jesus. And so the question for us then is, do you, do you, do you want your kids around Jesus? And maybe you're thinking, well, Jesus isn't walking around the neighborhood like he was for these families. Well, that's true. He's not walking the earth anymore, but his followers are. His people are. And so I ask, are you surrounding your children with the kind of people that you want your children to emulate? People that will point your children to Jesus. This is an important part of Christian parenting, is seeking to surround our children with the kind of people that are going to point them to Jesus, to live after Jesus. But then on the flip side of that, each one of us should ask ourselves, are we those kind of people that would be that parents are looking for? Are we the are am I the kind of man or woman that Christian parents would want their children to be influenced by? Godly man or woman who would have an impact on their lives. And maybe you're thinking, well, if I if I need to find these these followers of Jesus to to have my my children watch as well as myself, where am I going to find these these kinds of people? Well, good news. You're in the right place. They're in the church. In the church here, we are family, as I mentioned before. And as, and as I said, each one of you is a, is a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a brother or sister in the faith. That's why when we recognize mothers earlier on, that I, I recognize all mothers because you all have an impact in the lives of the children of our church. Moms and dads play the primary role, but each of us plays at least a small part. Some of you may be thinking, well, I, I don't have an influence on, on younger generations. But you do. 
you do, the way you live has an influence on the up and coming generation in this church and in a watching world. The way you, you, you treat young people in the church is teaching them what Jesus is like and what the church is like too. And so the question we must ask is this, are you, are you teaching them the right things by the way you live? Are you, are you giving them an accurate picture of who Jesus is and what the church is like, what the church should be? Well, I praise God and I thank him for godly parents and that I had godly people in my churches growing up that understood this. I was, I was blessed with both. And, and, and those people, those people in the churches that I grew up with, they, they talked to me. They spent time with me. They invested in me and loved me and showed me what it meant to be the family of God across generations. Church, I don't know if you realize this, but we are one of the few places left in society that is cross-generational. It's a good thing that, that our children be around older believers, that we not separate them off and compartmentalize them, but that they have other godly adult influences in their lives. Today, in part because of the influence I had in my church, the adults in my church is growing up, I love the church. And it's not just Omaha Baptist Church or First Baptist Green City that I love, but I love the church, the local church, because in my life growing up in the church, I've seen what God created her to be and do, and it is good. It is just good. Well, not only do we need to be serious about taking our children to church and being in the church and around other Christians where they might see other believers and how they live, but, but parents, by we are to be that influence as well by, by opening the, the word with them and teaching them ourselves, we are taking them to Jesus. We're bringing them to Jesus. The primary responsibility to disciple falls on us, parents. But as we'll see in the second half of verse 13, there will be opposition to bringing your kids to Jesus. There will be opposition. Sometimes it comes through the culture, maybe in the school system or through the television and the things that are watched or the music and the things that are heard. Or, or maybe there'll be pushback from your own kids as you seek to, to bring them to, the, to Jesus, to, to lead them in family worship or to, to bring them to church. And additionally, sometimes we as parents put up distractions ourselves. We oftentimes have misplaced priorities. We take things that are meant to be good and they become not good because they're exalted to the wrong level. One of the things I see around the church, not necessarily here so much, but in other places is the exaltation of, of sports and hobbies and travel to the neglect of the church. Focusing on, on these things. Again, sp I, I love sports. I'm excited that the Springfield Cardinals started up this week. I, I love throwing the ball around the backyard with my kids and playing wiffle ball and whatever it may be. But they must be seen in the right level of priorities. And they must not be exalted above the importance of being in church and teaching our kids the things of God. We have a priority, parents, of bringing our kids to Jesus. And so in the face of this opposition, we must be faithful and we must be diligent. Well, I want to go now to that, that 13th verse again and look more at the second half. You see, what, what we see in this second half of the verse is that Jesus and the disciples aren't on the same page in their view of, of children. The disciples think that the children are to be a, they're, that they're a distraction. But as we'll see, Jesus thinks of them as a delight. Let's read again the last part of that verse. Well, I'll just read all verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them, rebuked these families. So those in the crowd are bringing their small children, infants to Jesus, that he might pray over them, that he might bless them. And likely there are several families that are, that are gathered and, and waiting for Jesus, hoping that he'll pray over their young children and bless them. But the disciples did not respond so kindly to this. Jesus uh, well, it seems that they thought Jesus had better things to do than to pray over and touch these children and be with these children. 
After all, Jesus was, he was healing people. He was doing big things. He was, he was teaching crowds. He was casting out demons. He was dealing with these pesky old Pharisees. He didn't have time to be distracted by something so unimportant as children, did he? <laughs> oh, he did. So the disciples rebuked the parents. They, they tried to send the parents and these children away who were trying to get to Jesus. They did not understand to G, that to Jesus, children were never a distraction, never a drudgery, but always a delight. And so that brings us next to the Jesus' heart towards these children and toward all children in general. Jesus, Jesus loves children. In verse 14, it says, when he saw it, he was indignant. He said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. Do not keep them from coming to me. For such belongs the kingdom of God. Indignant is what he, the way he responded. That's a, a great displeasure that even contains an element of grief in response to what the disciples are doing. Grieving that the disciples are keeping these children away from him. Again, these, these children are not a distraction to Jesus' ministry. He, he loves children. He enjoys being with them. They're not a distraction to ministry. They are an aspect of his ministry. The heart of Jesus beats for children. Throughout Scripture, we see him perform many miracles involving children. And here again, Jesus demonstrates his love for children. Maybe as you've heard someone say, well, Jesus loves children. Maybe the song from your childhood, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Maybe that's come into your head. Well, as simple as that song is, it is true from beginning to end. Jesus loves children. Question for us then. We who seek to follow Jesus and imitate him, do we share Jesus' love for children? How do we view children? Do we see them as a burden or as a blessing? A burden or a blessing? Do, since Jesus loved and cared for children and we desire to be like Christ, we should share his love and care for children as well, seeing that they are not a burden but a blessing and a joy. And not only does Jesus love children, what we see in this verse is that he also affirms personhood and spirituality of children. He doesn't treat them as less than human. Remember how we were describing them, uh, describing the cultural context here and the way that society viewed them? These likely were very young children from the language that is used. And he doesn't treat them as subhuman, as if they're not, not valuable yet like the rest of the culture does. He dignifies them in his desire that they would come to him. Children are valuable. They are precious. They are important. And they ought to be loved and ministered to. But some might assert that teaching children is just training for, for teaching adults, for, for bigger things. I remember as a, as a youth pastor, some would say, well, when, when are you going to become a real pastor? Um, sure enough, in the Lord's providence, he, he brought me to be a real pastor, if you will. But But... Here's the thing. It's, it's not that any aspect of ministry is any less important than another. When you serve children, you're serving creatures created in the image of God that he loves and values and treasures. It is not a lesser task. SBC statistics show us that 19 out of 20 Christians come to Christ before the age of 25. 19 out of 20 our own experience here over the last nine months, we've had eight or seven baptisms and six of them have been children under 18 years of age. So our own experience testifies to this. So do you see the importance of ministry to children? Teaching children, ministering to children is not a second class role. There's a plug for Vacation Bible School right there, right? No, but it's, it's important. So children's ministry workers, youth ministry workers, Awana volunteers, VBS volunteers, moms, dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, church members, be encouraged and keep on. This is important work that we are doing in ministering to children. 
Let's pray as we minister to children for spiritual awakening and sensitivity in the hearts of our children. That, that the truths that are taught while they are young will sink deeply in, that they will take root, and that God will use our efforts as instruments to bring about spiritual rebirth in our children. Amen. As we have seen so far, Jesus is not distracted by children, but he's delighted in them. That he loves children and desires that the children would come to salvation when they are young, that they would scarcely know a day apart from Christ in their lives. And now we move to Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God. In verse 15, it says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Here we see the kingdom of God is to be received and to be received like a child. So what does it mean to say that? What, What does like a child mean, to be that the kingdom of God must be received like a child. Well, to think about this, let's first understand what it does not mean. And it does not, does not mean that one must come to faith in Jesus while a child. While child, children's ministry is, is super important, and we emphasize it, and youth ministry is very important, and we emphasize it, adults come to faith in Christ as well. And so that's that's not what's being said here. Nor does it mean that one must receive the kingdom of God like a child because children are innocent. Anyone who's ever met a child or been around one for very long knows they're not entirely innocent. Uh, I heard a pastor one time refer to a child as a viper in a diaper. Um, Maybe you can relate to the idea. (laughs) The the truth of that is simply this, that that we all inherit a sin nature. And we inherit it from conception. The truth that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God does not exclude children. It is all of us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it's not the the innocent aspect of this. So the point here also is not that one must receive the kingdom of God based on naivety or an unquestioning faith. Children. Those of you that have taught in children's ministry will know that children ask some of the hardest questions sometimes. And isn't that good that they're thinking about these things? Unfortunately, children think more deeply about the things of God sometimes than adults do. God does not desire that we would be naive. Rather, that we would be ready to give answers to questions. That we would be ready to give a a reason for the hope that is in us. And we'd be ready because we have thought through these hard things. You see, one of the things about questions is is this. Christians have no reason to shy away from questions. It's like whenever a, uh, a witness is on the stand and he knows the truth, he has no concern about answering the questions because he knows the truth. Brothers and sisters, we know the truth. We need not shy away from questions about the Bible. We need not shy away from questions about Christianity. When you know the truth, you need not be afraid of questions. So what's the point of this verse after all? Well, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it, because entrance into the kingdom of God requires childlike dependence upon God. Childlike dependence. It requires that we would recognize our helplessness and our dependence upon Him. That it's like that of a, of a baby who is entirely, completely, utterly helpless and dependent upon parents. Babies are born into the world helpless, completely dependent upon others for care. You, you know this. You've been around children enough to know that. It is impossible for them to care for themselves. They just can't do it. And likewise, we must come to to Christ with a recognition of our helplessness and with a childlike dependence upon Him. That the only way our needs will be met are through Him. That I can't do this on my own, that I need Him. As Americans, so oftentimes we pride ourselves on being a a hard-working people, that we're kind of a bootstrap society, as I refer to us. We we pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps. I worked hard. I accomplished it. I did it on my own. And sometimes we take these ideas into salvation as well, as if we did something somehow to earn favor from God and that we had a part in our own salvation. Brothers and sisters, let me 
assure you of this. You brought nothing to your salvation except the sin that required it. We need Jesus. We need dependence upon him. No one will enter the kingdom of God unless he or she receives God's salvation like a small child, like one who is utterly and completely dependent upon him. Every single infant in the world is entirely and absolutely helpless. As it is with every child who is born into this world, every child who is born into the kingdom of God must come in the same way, helpless and dependent. We must come to Christ recognizing our helplessness, recognizing our absolute dependence upon him. You see, there's no room for pride when you come to Jesus. Humility is a characteristic of one who has trusted Christ as their savior. As the song goes, nothing in my hand I bring. We have nothing to offer. Simply to thy cross I cling. Infants and small children provide a picture for us of what true believers must be. We must be those who know that we have nothing to bring but everything to receive. As we think about this passage and reflect on it again, I just want to reiterate, first of all, our attitude towards children must reflect that of Christ. Jesus loves children. The attitude of the church must be the same. We love and treasure children. The way we respond to the noises of children in worship reflect our attitude toward children. The, the, the willingness to uh, serve in, in a kid's ministry reflects our love for children. As children of God, we respond to Jesus' love for children by valuing them. And we do, we do so by, by joyfully and cheerfully loving and serving children that God has placed around us, be them in our homes, in our families, or in our churches. And we, we do so not by seeing them as a distraction or a hindrance or a burden, but as a delight, as a blessing. And as a God-given opportunity for us to joyfully raise up the next generation. To joyfully disciple them. And second, our dependence upon Christ must reflect that of a child. It must reflect that of a, of a child. Dependence upon Christ for salvation. And dependence upon Christ for righteousness. We, we bring nothing but a dirty rag to Christ. He offers righteousness, forgiveness of sins. And, and this uh, dependence upon Christ is not merely something that we, that we receive at salvation. It's not merely an attitude of when we come to faith in Christ, but it is an ongoing daily attitude. Jesus, I need you. As the hymn says, I need thee every hour. That's sung not by someone who is coming to trust Christ as their Savior. That's sung by the Christian who is day to day to day to day confessing, Lord, I need you. That is our attitude, brothers and sisters. Lord, I need you. We need him in our every hour, in our joys and in our sorrows, on the mountain and in the valley. And so the question is, do you, do you live your life in recognition of that need, calling out to him to supply that need for you? Have you confessed your helplessness to him? Do you recognize that you stand before him in need of salvation and forgiveness? That you have nothing to offer? That nothing you can do will earn forgiveness or right standing before God. Nothing you bring to the table can bring your salvation. It's only through the work of Jesus that we can be saved. Your best efforts and your good deeds leave you right where you started. Desperately in need of forgiveness. Grace is what you need. Grace plus nothing else. And this grace is found in Christ alone and in Christ, and no one else. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this message of, of childlike dependency. Lord, that we, that we come to you recognizing that, uh, that we don't have it all together, that there is nothing that we can do to merit our own salvation. Lord, we need your grace. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, help us to receive that gift in childlike faith. And Lord, may we continue to live our lives in complete and utter dependence upon you. Pray these things in Jesus' name.